This lecture will cover Tinea solium, the pork tapeworm. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives are for you to understand the life cycle of pork tapeworm, specifically know the difference between how you catch a tapeworm from how you catch neurocystis urcosis. Use that information to break the cycle. If you haven't learned about the beef tapeworm, Tinea saginata, please do that first. Now, I want you to appreciate who gets these infections, how to make a diagnosis depending on how it presents clinically, and how to confirm your suspicion with diagnostic testing, and of course, to become familiar with treatment options. This is our tree of pathogens. We're in the helminth section, in particular, the cestodes, or tapeworms. And as you recall, the tapeworms come in different flavors. This is the pig tapeworm. It's the only one where humans can be both definitive and intermediate hosts. So here's the life cycle. It starts in the upper right-hand corner when a person consumes undercooked pig flesh. And in the flesh of the pig, there are cysts. Each cyst uh, contains the invaginated, folded-up head of a worm. And as you can see in the bottom section, you know, that hunk of meat gets into the stomach. The stomach acid starts to digest the pig flesh. Uh, somehow, the invaginated protoscolex survives that torture, makes its way into the intestines. It pops open, hatches, and sucks down onto the intestinal mucosa and starts to grow its long chain of tails. The head looks just like the head of the beef tapeworm, except in addition to four suckers, it has this kind of menacing looking ring or rostellum of hooklets. Apparently that helps them to hold on to the intestines. The other difference is that the proglottids look a lot like the beef tapeworm, except number one, they have fewer uterine branches, and number two, they are not motile. Remember, the beef tapeworm proglottid has to be motile to get away from human feces into the grass because cows eat grass. Well, pigs eat feces, so the proglottids don't need to be motile. So that's the story with what we call teniasis. Teniasis is a zoonosis. We share it with pigs. You get it when you eat uh, pork, not when you eat feces. Humans are the definitive host, and those worms can stay in your intestines for up to a quarter of a century. They eat a little bit of what you eat. Otherwise, they don't take up much room. They may or may not cause some GI distress. Most people do not have symptoms with it. It's a very different story for cysticercosis. In cysticercosis, the human hasn't eaten pig flesh. They've eaten human feces with eggs. And when you eat an egg, in effect, you become the pig. So those eggs make their way through the stomach, they get into the intestines, and they burrow through the wall of the GI mucosa. From there, they get swept up into the vascular supply and travel throughout the body to the muscles, to the viscera, and to the brain. And when they do that, they create a cyst. That's their whole job, waiting for someone else to come along and consume that flesh. The problem is the mechanical process of having a cyst in a delicate part of the body. If you have a cyst in your tongue, probably not too bothersome. If you have a cyst in your brain, it may cause significant complications. So cysticercosis is sometimes called neurocysticercosis, or NCC. Remember, cysticercosis can happen anywhere in the body, but it usually presents in a clinical practice when it causes seizures or other neurologic complications. That's why it's usually called neurocysticercosis. This is an anthroponosis. It's shared with other human beings. You get it through fecal-oral transmission, and in this scenario, the human is playing the role of intermediate host hopefully dead-end host, unless someone comes along and eats you uh, in a cannibalistic fashion. So take a moment, look at this slide, get this integrated into your memory. If you eat a cyst, you'll get a worm, that's called teniasis, and that worm in return will create eggs, which if they are consumed will cause cysts, that's called cysticercosis. Humans get teniasis, either humans or pigs can have cysticercosis. So epidemiology, this happens any place where there are pigs, not this beautiful, cute little pink scrubbed pigs, but pigs that are feasting on human waste, right? In order to catch teniasis, you need poor meat inspection and the poor practice of cooking pork. You can actually eat cystic pork as long as you cook it first and inactivate those cysts. And in, case, in the case of cysticercosis, the problem isn't with the pigs, it's with the people. People who are not washing their hands appropriately after they defecate, then somehow contaminate the food that they're preparing with their own feces. This is a common issue and there are millions of people with either teniasis or cysticercosis worldwide. How does it present? Well, most people with either teniasis or cysticercosis do not have symptoms. It is well adapted to the human host. But in the case of teniasis, some people may pass a proglottid or pass an entire strobilial chain 
from their rectum, and that gets people's attention. It can cause some GI upset like diarrhea, belly pain, cramping, uh, or even anorexia. In the case of cystocercosis, this usually shows up when the patient has the new onset of seizures. In terrible cases, the cyst may make its way to the eyeball and cause blindness there. And some people will have tenderness, even feel the cysts within the belly of their muscles, biceps, and quads in particular. How will you make a diagnosis? Okay, so in the case of tiniasis, just take a history. Have you recently consumed raw or rare pork? And have you passed a proglottid or a big long chain of tapeworms from your butt? If so, there's your problem. But you can also look for the eggs in a fecal ova and parasite exam. And if you see these round eggs that look exactly like the eggs of the beef tapeworm, then you've made your diagnosis. On occasion, patients will have endoscopy. Gastroenterologist will see the tapeworms right then and there. Most of these patients do not have a high eosinophil count. In the case of cystocercosis, it's different. The history is, have you recently had the new onset of seizures? If so, has there been exposure to unclean food handling? Uh, has there been someone preparing your food who comes from a highly endemic area? Regardless, you're going to image the patient's brain, and magnetic resonance imaging is probably the best way to go. Sometimes the cysts will show up right with a CT scan as well. We can also do a skeletal survey looking for calcified cystic lesions in the belly of the muscles uh, of this patient as well. These patients are more likely to have a high eosinophil count. That usually happens as the, as the cyst breaks down and degenerates and exposes its antigens to the immune apparatus of the patient. However, the negative predictive value of this is poor, meaning there are plenty of people out there with cystocercosis who have a normal eosinophil level. You can also check a fecal ova and parasite. Why? Because some people who actually have tiniasis will auto-inoculate. They'll contaminate their own food with their own feces after they have a bowel movement. And sometimes that can help to confirm the diagnosis too. What do we do? Well, first of all, in the case of neurocystocercosis, we treat the seizures. Job one, treat with an anti-epileptic drug always. It's only job two that comes to killing the worms. And in fact, we have concern. If we kill those worms with anti-helminthic drugs, such as albendazole, that can lead to a significant increase in local inflammation because the antigens are being exposed to the immune system. And so we always pre-treat these patients with corticosteroids to tamp down that inevitable immunologic response. If we do not do that, these patients can have swelling in the brain worse seizures, even hydrocephalus. In the case of patients who have no neurocystocercosis, they just have a worm, we treat with praziquantel for their tiniasis, just like the beef tapeworm. In terms of breaking the cycle, you know, we need better public health measures. We need better sanitation in order to cut back on cystocercosis, and we need a better system to inspect the meat of these pigs to cut back on tiniasis. So those are the key concepts for tinea solium. This is the pork tapeworm, their cestodes, you can acquire tiniasis when you eat undercooked pork with cysts in it. You can acquire cystocercosis if you eat food that is contaminated with human feces containing the eggs up from that worm. It happens every place in the world where there's poor sanitation and where people raise pigs. It's often asymptomatic, but in the case of tiniasis, people may pass a worm or a piece of a worm. And in the case of neurocystocercosis, people may have seizures. You make a diagnosis, check in the poop for proglottids or eggs, or by looking for neurocystocercosis using an MRI or a CT scan. We always treat those seizures aggressively. We always tamp down the immune system and then, and only then, go after the worms in the case of neurocystocercosis. We prevent this by better sanitation, better pork inspections. If in doubt, for God's sakes, please cook that pork. And also, choose your food handlers wisely. Thank you for your attention.